thank you so much for being with us today. We have folks from around the globe joining our call, folks from Canada, California, Seattle, Florida, Pennsylvania, Larchmont, New York, Boston, and a bit closer to home here in Glasgow and Edinburgh, Manchester and London. You're all very warmly welcomed and we are so pleased to have you along. We hope you find the following presentation both informative and inspirational. I'm joined today by my colleague, Jessica Constable, along with our three guests who will be speaking to the importance and relevance of the research hub to the university as a whole, to our research community and to the world at large with the important discoveries they will make there. We are delighted to welcome Professor Neil Juster, Senior Vice Principal and Deputy Vice Chancellor. Professor Andrew Tobin, Director of the Research Hub and eminent molecular pharmacologist, along with Dr. Stephanie Connolly, lecturer and research lead in water and the environment. Just a few elements of housekeeping to go over with you. You've joined our call today on mute and with your cameras off. We are very happy for you to keep both of those off throughout the duration of the presentation. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded. If any questions come to mind during the presentation, I would encourage you to put them into the chat function and my colleague Jessica will help facilitate those questions to our speakers at the very end. I'm now going to turn things over to Neil to kick off. Thank you so much again and Neil, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. And hello everybody. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this special event in support of our forthcoming flagship interdisciplinary facility on our campus, formerly known as the Research Hub, and now just recently confirmed as the University of Glasgow's Advanced Research Centre, or the ARC. I would dearly like to be welcoming you to our campus today to see the building coming out of the ground in person. But instead, we shall have to settle for Zoom, which I'm sure that many of you have become intimately familiar with over the past eight or nine months. When COVID-19 first reached the UK, it put the brakes on the construction of the ARC for quite a while, ironically during a period in our history that could not be better demonstration of its critical importance. The pandemic has forced us to distance ourselves from one another, but at the macro level, it has also underscored just how tightly connected and interdependent our global society is. There is no social distancing of our shared challenges as a species. And now more than ever, it's deeply apparent that our future prosperity will depend on our ability to work in partnership together to address the most pressing grand challenges of our age. The ARC is a new sort of facility for a new era in our university's contribution to the advancement of human knowledge and understanding. And to illustrate that, I want to tell you a short story about where we've come from. Our Gilmore Hill campus celebrated its 150th birthday this weekend. And those of you who've walked around its iconic main building centerpiece, the Gilbert Scott building, may have noticed an abundance of turrets dotted around its quad. And if you look above the arches, you will notice disciplinary labels such as nursing and geography. Walk up any one of those turret staircases and you will soon end up in the door of a lecture theatre set aside for that discipline. So far, so unsurprising. But when you consider the historical implications of this setup, it's really quite startling. Professors would leave their private homes on Professor Square and send their private staircases to deliver lectures to the same small group of students and return to their house without ever running the risk of meeting someone from outside their own area of expertise. Now this might sound like heaven to misanthropes, but we know that it's a disaster for any academic community because universities only reach their full potential when they are fertile hotbeds of diverse expertise and perspectives. Tony Shea, the recently retired CEO of the American shoe company Zappos, considers collaboration to be the lifeblood of any creative organization and actively talks about designing environments to encourage what he calls collisions, serendipitous encounters between colleagues. The arc has been designed from the outset with maximizing collisions between disciplines and colleagues in mind, because to extend the metaphor, we believe that given enough collisions, you get sparks of inspirations, of deeper insight, 
of ideas for collaborations that would just change the world. We know that this will work. We're so confident, in fact, that we're moving some of our most exciting and globally renowned researchers and teams into the ARC to work alongside one another, including, of course, some of the key PIs behind the university's research beacons, the cross-disciplinary areas of research excellence and expertise, where we believe we have the greatest potential to make discoveries of global importance. The ARC will house some of our most elite researchers, but the building itself will be for everybody. Core to the philosophy of the building is that collisions will not only be regular, but diverse. And that means opening the facility up to as many people as possible, including the general public. The ground floor of the hub will be entirely open and offer a mix of spaces for events, conferences, exhibitions, and relaxed coffee shop meetings, a building that truly belongs to Glasgow and its people. Life within the ARC will be a far cry from the cloistered life of those professors long ago, a new way of working for a new generation. And perhaps the most exciting aspect of this new facility for me personally is that while the end goal is world changing impact, the building itself is designed to take academics on that journey from the very start of their career. Much of the ARC space will reserve for our early career researchers and other new re university recruits, offering the next generation of world changers a world-class research space within a world-changing research culture from day one. In this sense, the art will be an incubator for talent. Their skills and ideas will be honed alongside peers of every discipline as they become established as leaders within their own area. And they will move out of the hub and spread the benefits of its culture of open collaboration right across the university. I truly believe that the art will be the most significant and transformative facility built on our campus since the university's move to Gilmore Hill in 1870. With your help, we can ensure that our world-changing vision for the art becomes a reality. And now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Professor Andrew Tobin, to give you a few more details on the art. Andrew. Thank you, everybody, for, for uh, joining us uh, joining us on this uh, on this Zoom call. And uh, and I've been tasked um, with uh, with describing what is happening in the in the arc. Uh, to give you a flavour of the of the investment that the university has made, and um, and just to um, and just to encourage you to be part of this of this greater vision. And so the arc itself, uh, there's a picture of it here, is made up over five floors. It'll have 600 researchers in there. We have five research themes, which I will describe to you. 113 million pounds worth of investment. It's a serious undertaking. It is designed to change the way and the culture in which we do research, not just within the university, but across the, not just within the ARC itself, but across the campus and, uh, and across the university, and ideally be a beacon for research uh, across the world. And so I'd just like to start by, um, by, by describing that to you, and I will try to move on to the next slide. And so the, and so the vision for the ARC, um, is to unlock previously out of reach research that will have an impact both globally and across society. And that's a, that's a, a grand vision. Um, we will des it's designed, as uh, Neil said, to be interdisciplinary, um, to bring research groups together. But it's much more than that. I think, I think that we really do want to say we're bringing in the top research groups and my role as director is to ask them not to do their job as they're doing it at the moment but to really have ambitious programs which are which are currently not possible within the campus as we have it at the moment and so the um the the we've organized ourselves into five research themes and i'd like to describe those themes to you the first one I'd like to describe is a, thing, a theme we call uh, quantum and nanotechnologies. And this is bringing together the physicists across the building um, that are interested in, uh, in light and how light can be applied to sensors and to our understanding of the world. Uh, also, the, they're experts in gravitational waves and, um, and these technologies. These people will have an entire floor of the research hub. Just above those people on level five will be chemical intelligence. This is now a group of uh, our leading chemists that are leading in the areas of defining the origins of life, for example, and, um, and new ways in which we can, uh, we can harness computer generated chemistry to produce new drugs of the future. 
Um, alongside those is uh, the theme that I'm uh, involved in, technologies touching life. This is a biology-based theme, looking for new medicines, uh, for treating some of the world's biggest health challenges, as well as designing structures that can mimic bone and, and, and the like using stem cell technologies. Um, alongside there is international development with a global aspect on healthcare, on society, and on the way that um, we interact in the global north and global south. And finally, we have creative economies, which is focused now on people, on ethics, on legislature, on the way that we um, engage in our creative industries uh, to make a, a better society. If I could simplify that for you and think of these five themes along these lines, along the lines of light, molecules, medicine, people, and global. And it's a real challenge, isn't it, to bring these disciplines together and to say, we want you to stop doing what you're doing so well and do something which, you, which is incredibly creative and, out, and, and previously out of reach. And I'm just going to give you a small example of how that is actually happening. If we look at what's happened with technologies touching life and nano and quantum, you will know that when you go into the doctors at the moment, that you have various imaging technologies that are placed in front of you, X-ray, MRI, ultrasound, incredible uh, inventions, some of which, and particularly ultrasound here in Glasgow, an invention out of Glasgow. But what will your trip to the doctor look like in 2050? And excitingly, from Daniele Faccio's work and John Cooper's work from Technologies Touching Life and Nano and Quantum, they have had a major award to ask what it will imaging look like in the in 2050. And this has brought together doctors, it's brought together health economists, it's brought together physicists, and it's brought together people like me, biologists. And we're all colliding, as Neil said, in the, in the research hub to ask what will that new imaging technology be like in 2050? And please, in the question session afterwards, ask me what that lo will look like, because sensors in clothes, mapping how people move, diagnosing people in their homes, this is what we're aiming for out of the arc. And of course, that's fine on a science level, but how does that affect our behavior? How does that affect the way that we, um, the way that we see ourselves and the health service, the way that, is it ethical, is it legal? What is the impact on society? And that's brought in the creative economies. And of course, what I'm challenged with in my colleagues is that they say, Andrew, you know what? You, you live in the West End of Glasgow. People don't all live in the West End of Glasgow in your, in your nice apartments. What does that look like in the global South? Can we introduce these digital technologies which are coming out of the physics people, which are impacting on our healthcare, which is changing society in the, in the, in the, in the affluent countries? How does that look like in the developing nations? Can you see how all this comes together? And finally, I'd like to just to touch on chemical intelligence. We're working with chemical intelligence to ask how do drugs actually work? And then can we make drugs better? This is a chemical computer, a computer, a, 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 a computer as they call it, making new drugs for the 21st century. So we're going to do that by creating flexible space, which is open not just to the occupants of the ARC, but across the campus. Uh, we have wonderful agile space, which is designed for project management and for uh, group meetings and for these collision of ideas. Um, and finally, I'd like to just touch on the second major vision, and that is to open the university up to all. The arc will be the whole floor of that, as Neil has already said, is dedicated to who? To the general public, to you. Uh, we want to co-create, we want to do research which is being driven by the public, which the public care about, which the public give us permission to do. There's a real sense that we're going away from the turrets of the Gilmore Hill campus and into a time when we engage with, um, with, 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 with the public and have a servant-hearted attitude, breaking down barriers and increasing accessibility. And we're going to do that on level two um, with having a cafe. We're just I'm just going to show you a few photographs 
of our social robotics and uh, which will be uh, on level two as well. Um, interacting here with, uh, with a lot of school children, you can see how we are gonna use that level for a cafe, for lectures, for interaction with the public, but more than just informing the public of what we do, more engagement with the public and including the public in the research ideas. So finally then, this is the arc. This is where we're focused at the moment in terms of presenting to you this incredible opportunity that's at the heart of our campus. But we want these ideas to extend beyond the building and influence the culture and direction of research across the entire campus. And in that way, we anticipate and aim to engage the entire city in this journey um, of discovery and in these new ways of doing research with the ultimate aim of influencing um, research and impact across the globe. And so I'm just finishing now and I would just say that um, that just as this as the video runs I'll just say these last things. You are already part of this vision. Being an alumni of this university has been the backbone of all the ideas that have come to this. This has moved through two, um, two principles to get us into the position that we're in at the moment. So do feel part of this journey already, but it'd be wonderful if you can continue to support us in all the ways that you can uh, in just showing up to this meeting is amazing come to our opening festival get engaged with what's going on with this new venture and i really look forward to hopefully meeting you all one day in person and i'll hand over to stephanie uh thanks as as angie said um my name is stephanie connolly i'm an early career researcher who will be uh, moving into uh, the arc uh, when it opens um i've got a few slides today uh to give you um uh, an example of the type of project that I hope we'll be able to thrive and that we'll be able to build on uh, in the ARC. Um, in my work, I, I look at uh, the limit state design of biotechnologies for sustainable decentralised water treatment, which fits under the theme of international development. Um, by way of background, uh, myself, I'm a, a graduate from uh, the University of Glasgow. My undergraduate degree is in civil engineering and I have a P PhD in biotechnology uh, development. My research specialism specifically is in the ecology of biological wastewater treatment processes uh, for sustainable off-grid sewage treatment. And while sewage treatment is perhaps not the most glamorous of research topics, it's one that's desperately in need of address. So the UN estimates that today, as many as 2.4 billion people worldwide live without access to safe sanitation. 1.2 billion live without access to a safe drinking water source, and as much as 80% of the wastewater we generate globally is released to the environment untreated. The impact of that on public and environmental health is devastating, and sustainable address of such an extensive problem is one of the greatest engineering challenges facing society today. Uh, I work as part of the Water and Environment Research Team at Glasgow. Collectively, we will all um, move into the ARC. Um, and we are a team of researchers comprising mathematical modelers, molecular microbiologists, forensic chemists, bioinformaticians, and engineers who work together at the forefront of water treatment biotechnology development. And why biotechnology? Well, across the global north, wastewater treatment is in the main successfully managed at, uh, centralized sewage treatment plants using biotechnologies that in fact were first developed over a hundred years ago. In those, the metabolism of thousands of species of bacteria are harnessed to transform contaminants in water to make the water safe for discharge to our environment. While effective in cleaning our water, however, these technologies are both water and energy intensive and deployment relies on heavy infrastructure, including hundreds of miles of underground pipe networks that are expensive to install and maintain. Further, the underlying biology can be fickle. It behaves in unpredictable ways such that failures are commonplace. A great deal of inno innovation in water treatment is currently underway in rapidly developed, developing cities across the globe where water treatment infrastructure is presently lacking. And promising among those are novel biotechnologies designed to treat waste at the point of production, thereby eliminating the needs for heavy infrastructure to transport water off-site. While they're promising, as in our full-scale treatment plants, 
The biology that drives treatment in these systems can behave unpredictably. And that's where our research team comes in. So um, I give here uh, an example of one of the projects that we work on um, that's very much uh, underpinned by interdisciplinarity. Um, so the example is of a current collaboration, uh, which is ongoing with the Asian Institute of Technology or AIT, uh, which are, is a research institute based in Bangkok and Thailand. Uh, the figure on the left of the slide you can see is a schematic of a very simple but novel biotechnology called the solar septic tank. The technology was developed by our collaborators at AIT on a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation research project um, where they were challenged to reinvent the toilet. And the Gates Foundation gave out many of these grants. And while the vast majority of recipients in research labs across the world went high tech in their design solutions, our collaborators in Thailand developed instead a suite of uh, low cost and low tech interventions that can be retrofitted to existing technologies. Uh, it's called the solar septic tank because it harnesses heat from the sun to raise the in-tank temperature. The higher temperatures elevate the activity of the microbes that live in the system to promote more rapid degradation of the waste as compared to that in a standard septic tank. And the higher temperatures in the central core of the tank act to partially pasteurize um, the water before we discharge it to the environment. It's a novel solution. It's been demonstrated in small scale field studies um, and it has the potential to enable safe sewage treatment at the household scale. But what remains to be optimized is the biology. So at Glasgow, we were uh, awarded funding from the UK Grand Challenges Research Fund that's enabled us to work with the Thai research team uh, over the last three years. And together we've monitored the microbiology in 15 solar septic tanks deployed in the field across Bangkok uh, and in neighbouring Cambodia. Samples of influent, sludge and effluent from each septic tank were collected monthly over the course of a year-long trial, along with physical, chemical and performance data. At Glasgow, we used a cutting-edge next-generation sequencing of DNA in the samples to reveal which microbes were present when the system works well, yeah. and those whose presence indicates the onset of process instability. Having characterised uh, the biology in the system, at Glasgow, we also collaborated with a team in digital chemistry to develop a robotics platform that we fondly refer to as the WasteBot. So WasteBot is photographed there on the right um, as a hardware robot. It's, it's fairly simple. Uh, it combines a heated incubation space where we can grow microbes, um, an automated uh, pipette for liquid handling, and a sensor that can monitor uh, microbial growth and activity. But importantly, the robot's guided by an optimization algorithm and it's able to rapidly scan through uh, a complex experimental search space to identify optimal growth conditions for the good bacteria in our system with minimal user intervention. The developed platform, we hope, will be published later this year and uh, further is going to be redeployed on the optimization of microbial communities for drinking water biofilters. Uh, to be deployed uh, in Scotland later next year. And then finally, while we recognise that our next generation sequencing data reveals vital information on uh, system function, we recognise that it's prohibitively expensive for homeowners to use uh, to monitor their septic tanks. And therefore, in collaboration with the team uh, at Glasgow in biomedical engineering, we're working to adapt low cost paper diagnostic tools that were originally developed um, to enable low cost uh, medical diagnosis in the field, uh, to adapt those to detect the DNA of key species and genes in the solar septic tank effluent, including those belonging to important pathogens, organizations, uh, uh, sorry, organisms associated with system function and organisms associated with antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and thereby, uh, by, uh, design of these devices, then we hope to give uh, solar septic tank owners vital information on the performance of the system in which they've invested their money. So projects like these uh, are really only possible when scientists, social scientists and engineers from a broad range of backgrounds are afforded the opportunity to work together towards a common goal. Um, and it's opportunities like that that hope um, 
we're able to build on in the new hub. So bringing together a diverse range of researchers from across the university and with them the best and in international collaborators will benefit from access to purpose-built labs and meeting spaces such um, that the building itself will lend uh, itself to the development of new interdisciplinary collaborations. And I believe that it's when we work across disciplines that we really challenge our individual research perspectives to improve our understanding of global challenges and to hone new problem definitions, and ultimately to enable a development of innovative and impactful solutions to grand global challenges. Uh, and with that, I can uh, hand back over, uh, I think, to uh, Jess. Stephanie, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you for sharing that information with us. Um, and also thank you to Neil and Andrew for um, your fantastic presentations as well. Um, and a third thank you has to go out to our Research Hub supporters and also our campus development and general supporters here on the call with us. Um, I hope that you are feeling very proud of what you're helping us to achieve through your support, so thank you. For those of you who feel galvanised to support the completion of this project, which is coming up um, at the beginning of next year, um, I should let you know that there is still time. Um, it's possible to make tax-efficient gifts from the UK, US and Canada, um, and donations can be made through a variety of ways, including online, bank transfers, stock uh, transfers, um, and it's uh, perfect to speak with myself or one of the team here um, at the Development Alumni Office if this is of interest. Uh, pledges from £500 will be recognised on the art donor wall right here in Glasgow, and pledges from £10,000 and above can name physical spaces within the building. All pledges can be spread over a period of five years, and we'll share all of this information in follow-up. So, Firstly, we had a question from Sue Goodman that I wanted to address, and um, she was asking where the ARC is in terms of the campus, and um, I just wanted to promise that we'll also send out a picture following this uh, event with the map of the campus. We'll share a great graphic with you to, to point that out. And so, on to our other questions, uh, the first of which uh, came in for you, Andrew, um, which asked about legal researchers in the ARC and whether they would be asked to assist with the legal and ethical questions which might arise, I think, from the first example you gave during yes. your presentation. Thank you for that question. I think that one of the things that I think I wanted to, it, it's always difficult to describe these things, isn't it, in, in such a short period of time. Um, international development um, and both international development and creative economies are both very interested in the legal, ethical and societal impact of the research as Stephanie just uh, described to us. Um, there will be people that are, that are interested in legal aspects, but, but I think that the very important point of this whole venture that we're on is that, and it refers to another question that's come up, is that we are not confined by the building. So the building is very important, is a, is a focal point for activity, but it's very important that we do not make an elite enclave uh, on the campus. And so this building were, is designed to catalyze ideas and interactions across the entire campus. So just because you're not in this building does not mean you're not part of the arc. And, um, and I think that that's one of the points that I'd want to make. So if you're a brilliant legal, expert and you happen to be somewhere in the Gilmore Hill uh, campus, somewhere in the Gilbert Scott building, then you are as much part of this venture as anybody who actually has an office, which are actually incidentally rather small because we wanted to make lots of them um, in the arc. And so uh, I hope that answers your question. We will go where, where the experts are. They're not confined to the building. Wonderful. Yeah, I see the question I think you're referring to about creating an us and them culture. So that's uh, fantastic to address that. Thank you. Um, we had a, another question, which I will direct toward you again, Andrew, was about um, whether researchers will move in and out of the hub as their projects develop. Wow, what, 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 a, what a contentious question to ask. Is this being recorded? It is, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, so um, so this is going to be a building very different from other buildings because again we're trying to address issues of culture. Um, 
there will be changes in research emphasis. You've just got it with COVID. Somebody asked a COVID question. Of course, we'd, this time last year, nobody would know what COVID was. So of course, the, the landscape changes, priorities changes, world events change things. And, uh, and this building needs to be flexible. Also, dare I say, researchers sort of um, come and go. They, 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 they need to, to rethink um, their place um, in the research pecking order as well. So I think that, um, that we're, under, we're under no illusions that we need a process of governance, which moves people in and out, basically responding to, um, to the needs that, 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 that are out there in terms of research. So we do not, uh, I'll be entering uh, the, the ARC building itself um, and, uh, and I'll be under scrutiny for the performance of us. And when I'm saying the performance, I mean the collaborative nature, the impactfulness of the research and, uh, and are we making a difference? And if that premier research space needs to be taken up by somebody else in two or three years time, then, um, then we have a governance system that will ensure that. Thank you very much. Um, a question there for you, Neil. I'll read it exactly how it uh, was provided in the chat. So uh, it goes, thoroughly applaud the aspiration to engage with public, but I don't imagine residents of Glasgow's poorest postcodes turning up to the cafe. In terms of understanding public need for health improvement, what is the nature of the ARC's relationship with the NHS? Um, they're an NHS scientist researching children's vision um, following maternal drug use. Uh, an excellent question. And of course, uh, although we will open up the campus and particularly this building to uh, the public, it doesn't necessarily mean they will uh, want to come on, on campus. But I think as Andrew mentioned in his introduction, we will be curating a whole lot of events not just in the ARC, but, uh, but around the whole, the whole new campus development that we're doing. This building is also going right next to uh, a building that's just, another one that's coming out of the ground, probably about a year behind this one for our Institute of Health and Wellbeing. Uh, so the interactions between what's going on in the ARC and what's going on in the Institute of Health and Wellbeing will be addressing some of these issues. Uh, there is, I, I, I maybe should look to Andrew, I don't think there's an absolute direct relationship between the researchers uh, in the building and the NHS, but again, the building is right opposite uh, the buildings which are occupied by our British Heart Foundation, uh, cardiac teams, uh, and some of our uh, immunology uh, uh, professors. So we are building the building which allows this interaction uh, between all of these scientists and all these uh, clinical uh, scientists as well. So as Andrew also said, you, just because you're, you don't have to be in the building to be part of the art community. So we are working very hard to have those networks of engagement, both with the general public, but also with the NHS. Can I add something to, to, Neil's, to Neil's statement there, Jessica? I, I, mean, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, Neil, Neil's, Neil's hit it on the head. I mean, I mean what we have in the Queen Elizabeth's uh, Hospital, just, a, just a, a mile or two down the road, is an amazing facility, which is, which is a university hospital. So it's a, it's, a, it's a research hospital. We have a development there on the Govan site called the Living Lab, 40 million pounds worth of, of uh, government investment in, some, in, in, a, in an infrastructure which is going to again address healthcare needs going into the, you know, into, into the decades ahead. This is now a direct link with the basic scientists in the ARC. And I'm very keen for that link to be, to be strengthened. I, I'm in a college, which is, uh, which is medicine and, uh, and, and life sciences, as well as veterinary sciences. And so we're very closely linked with the NHS. So believe me, we, we sit, I mean, I sit on a COVID board tomorrow with heads of uh, ICU, as well as the basic scientists. So it is a very integrated approach. In terms of the question around, um, uh, un, uh, underprivileged areas. I mean, um, health and well-being uh, is being built, as, as Neil just said, right next door to the ARC, and they have uh, um, um, sort of tentacles that go out in those communities. But I care really very much about how kids in Lark Hall will actually integrate with a uh, an elite establishment like the University of Glasgow. And I think that the, at the heart of this is to ask that question. And I think the questioner is absolutely spot on. It's very unlikely that those kids are gonna rock up in our cafe and see our robots. We have to be able to get our, our, our boots on and go out into those communities. And we have an engagement team 
who's charged with ex doing exactly that. We're not going to sit passively waiting for people to arrive. We think those people will arrive from the West End and all the fancy areas of Glasgow, but we want to get out into those other areas to break down those barriers and, uh, and make this university accessible to everybody in this city. Wonderful, thank you, Andrew. Um, now I'll have a question for Stephanie, which is about interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, Stephanie mentioned mathematical modeling, algorithms for optimization and software for data. How can those in maths and stats, et cetera, get embraced in these activities? So I guess it's that question of bringing in other teams again. Yeah, so I guess as much as we are based in uh, an engineering department um, and we are the Water and Environment Engineering Group, um, the vast majority of our staff, in fact, aren't engineers. So we routinely already collaborate uh, in a very uh, interdisciplinary way. Um, I think simply because it's necessary, uh, there's a limit to the, uh, the expertise that can be contained within sort of one person or that one person can have a, 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 a perfect handle on. Uh, and I think what's important is, is almost uh, to be able to learn to speak to people across disciplines uh, so that we can enable um, uh, good interdisciplinary uh, communication. Um, so certainly I would hope that um, the collaborators that we already have within our team, we would be bringing that with us uh, to the hub. Uh, and I guess by being in the hub, perhaps what we do uh, can become uh, more public or we, there'd be better visibility for the research that we do, uh, which again would increase opportunity for people to collaborate with us. Thank you. Um, I think next one would be best for Neil. Um, so for alumni with particular interest in or desire to support some of the research beacons, how best can they assess progress and means of contributing uh, knowledge, expertise and financial? Well, the, the, we, ha we have two phases. We have, we have the research beacons and we have the research themes uh, in the hub and both things are, are interconnected. Uh, but I, I guess the best way to, to be connected is to, to stay connected with, with the alumni, with you, Jessica and, uh, and Catherine, in terms of uh, the, the, the word that's going out of the research that's going on and keeping an eye on our, our, our general publications. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll reiterate that. Contact us. <laughs> um, okay, and last five minutes, so I've got a few more questions to get through. Um, one about uh, collaboration with business or industry groups and will there be spaces for this within the ARC? So maybe Andrew, do you want to jump in on this one? Yeah, yeah, no, that is very close to my heart and thank you for that question. Um, yes, um, yes, it's always a, always a tricky one, isn't it, between uh, basic research, fundamental research and, uh, and link with industry. Um, I have to say my heart is with, um, with developing the links with industry. Um, we will, and I'm, I'm a biomedical scientist, so we will be setting up a what we call a translational lab, which is a lab which is uh, dedicated to um, to uh, priming projects so that they are more attractive for industry. So using the creative ideas that are coming out of our basic research programs and fashioning them to address uh, questions for industry. So the answer is absolutely yes. However, it's difficult to put loads of spin out companies in the arc. I don't think we want to do that. I think um, it gives me an opportunity to press Neil on the development of the Church Street um, um, buildings where we, um, where we will be um, spinning companies from across the campus, but also out of the visit building, the arc building um, into, into, the, into, that, uh, into those facilities. But absolutely, we're not missing a trick there with the, um, with the yeah, engagement of industry. I'll just come in very briefly on, on the back of that, Andy. When the map comes out tomorrow that shows where the research hub is, you'll see where the health and well-being building is going. But it's also backing on to Church Street, which is where we're developing innovation zone. And sort of following on also for an answer to the question about how alumni can, can help as we spin out companies. It's not just financial support we need as a university. We need the expertise to help us understand how those, those companies can make a real impact and, and develop. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure alumni can help in, in that, that as well. Um, Stephanie, a timely question has come up asking whether your invention would pick up COVID and indeed future threatening viruses. Uh, 
yes, so it certainly could. And in fact, um, at the point uh, at which our labs closed down, uh, the research team who were developing our device for monitoring uh, septic tanks uh, redeployed their time and expertise to, to work on, on, on COVID development. So those are uh, biomedical engineers and it's very much something um, that, that uh, they, they've been at the forefront of the contribution to. Um, in terms of the device that we are developing, uh, we're hoping to be able to use it uh, to uh, monitor antimicrobial resistant bacteria. So that's bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, which themselves are a particular concern. Um, we find them in our wastewater treatment plants here in the UK, and we certainly find them in wastewater uh, across the globe, particularly in places where antibiotics, for example, uh, aren't regulated. Um, so yeah, our, our current device should be able to detect uh, uh, some genes associated with antimicrobial resistance and yeah, the potential is there to detect viruses too. Yeah. Okay, um, and so trying to fit in uh, two more if we can. Uh, Andrew, how will product profiles be defined and diverse technologies integrated to create desirable products from the ARC? Wow, that, that's, a hard, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little bit to do with the um, commercialization that we talked about earlier. I think I think that's I think that's a great question, and 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 you know we're we're going to have to give some some thought to that. We have um, labs which we're calling materialization labs. I hope this answers your question. And um, and and in those labs, I mean these are now research labs. They're not going to be. We've got maker labs on on level two for the for the general public, but these are going to be designed for next generation diagnostics and those of you that know uh, how biomedical uh, how drug discovery goes it's it now is very important that you have companion diagnostics and the engineering department is extremely good you've already heard from stephanie how we engage with engineers across the piece and one of the ways of doing that is in diagnostic tools and in technologies touching life is a theme that I'm involved with. We have new diagnostics which are going into malaria, for example, and that's very much linked with international development with their with their contacts in Africa. So um, it's a. I think that was a little bit of a woolly answer for you, to be honest with you. And uh, but we're very. Um, I think that's what you what you mean by a, a product uh, other than a, a a drug or a new way of processing waste. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. And that is us at 5.15. So although we have a few more questions, we better wrap, wrap up to respect people's time. Um, if anyone has a question that hasn't been answered, please do uh, respond to our follow-up email, ask it, and we will make sure that it's answered by one of the team. Um, but Neil, Andrew, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so insightful for myself, let alone I'm sure all of the alumni uh, from around the world who've been on the call this evening. So thank you. Um, we look forward to speaking with everybody who's uh, joined us on the call in our follow up. We hope that you'll feel inspired to support if you haven't already. Thank you to our, our existing donors and have a wonderful evening and take care. Thank you.